Good morning. morning. Welcome. Thank you for being here this morning. And uh, to those of you who are mothers, happy Mother's Day. Uh, We're so glad to have you. We celebrate you. Amen. Amen. And and we're going to pray for you. But as we do that, I want to acknowledge something that a day like this is sort of a mixed bag for some of us. Uh, for some of us, it's, it's, it's a really good day. For others of us, it, it's a day that evokes certain thoughts and feelings. For some of you, this may be your first Mother's Day without Mama. For others of you, this may be your 15th or your 20th, but it brings up those emotions fresh every time it comes around. Some of you weren't mama well, and uh, so some of you are wrestling with how to give thanks in that process. Can I say to you this, that, uh, that in the book of Isaiah, God is not only returned, re- referred to in paternal, uh, but also in maternal instincts. That in Isaiah, God is likened to a mother. So even if you weren't mamad well, uh, God's maternal grace and love and nurture and care is there for you, um, even if maybe you didn't receive that from an earthly mother. But I, I do want to say this. I want to pray together. And I want to pray and rejoice for those of you who through your diligence and your character building, shape the lives of your children. I want to pray for those of you who are grieving, and I want to pray for you, those of you who are maybe resting on God's maternal grace uh, today. So Father, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for the grace that you extend to us in moments like this. We thank you for the celebration of these moms who, who work diligently and tirelessly and sacrificially, who give themselves away to the task of raising up children and uh, tending to and caring for those that you've entrusted with them with. We thank you for the, the, the sleepless nights and the early mornings. Uh, we thank you for the sacrifices they make to make sure everyone else has, even if they don't have. We thank you for that grace. We thank you for the memories that flood our minds. Even though those memories tend to bring a tear with them at times of the moms who are no longer with us, Lord, we recognize those tears are just part of the process of love. It's just, that's, we don't have to scurry through it or rush through it or hurry through it at all. We can let it be in these moments and just, just rem, be reminded of and remember those, those joyous occasions uh, that we had with those moms who may not be with us here on this earth, but are here in our hearts. And Lord, we pray for those who, who really honestly have not been mommed well, um, that your maternal grace would be with them, nurturing them, comforting them, surrounding them, shaping them, molding them, forming them, and being what they need in these moments. Father, you are good, and you are true, and you are faithful, and we celebrate that. And Lord, as we turn our hearts to the preaching of your word, we pray that you would be faithful to move in and through what you want to say to us today. Uh, Myself included, I need to hear it as much as anyone and everyone in this place. Um, So make up what I'm lacking, my inabilities, deficiencies, inadequacies, Lord, so that I can be at some level a faithful steward of the good news gospel story of Jesus Christ. And we'll be certain in the midst of all of this to give you glory in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as was the beginning, is now, will be forever. And all of God's people said, amen. So there she was, this this mother of three, after having run errands all day. Those children had reached a fevered pitch in the shrill of their shrieking, I'm hungry! That would have sent even the bravest of souls running for the hills. But not her. She was in. She wasn't going anywhere. No matter how much she felt like the eardrums were going to burst or the head was throbbing or her arms were just wore out from holding that thrashing, kicking, hair-pulling blessing. (laughs) Hoping for a moment of reprieve, a moment where they could be entertained, she pulled into McDonald's. The one with the plague land. <laughs> and their eyes, they turned to the windows. And this momentary glaze of joy came over their faces as they anticipated what was to come. She had now in that moment gone from the oppressive tyrant of errands to the patron saint of happy meals and joy. <laughs> Unloading these miscreants, I mean blessings... Unbuckling one with one arm, as with the other arm, she reaches out and snags the shirt of the child who's about to dart out into traffic. Their anticipation was almost intoxicating. Those golden arches. This was the moment that they'd all been waiting for. She strolls up to the counter and with great boldness, she announces three happy meals. 
And the cashier smiles. And the children smile. And she anticipates this moment where in just a few minutes, those hounds will be released, those blessings will be released into that tangled web of germ-filled foot-smelling tubes. (laughs) Knowing that as long as she doesn't have to crawl in there and go and rescue any of them, this will be a good end to the afternoon. The order is made. The total is given. The card is produced. The chip inserted and declined. Duh. Her heart skips a beat. Beads of sweat on the forehead. Her pulse rate increases. But she's a champ. She will not be dissuaded. No, no, no. It's probably the wrong card. So she goes back into her purse and she pulls out the credit card. That trusty sidekick that had been with her day after day and purchase after purchase. And with resolve... declined the kids completely ambivalent to the adulting issues happening at the counter they could taste the nuggets and feel the texture of those snot slime tubes of joy and looking up awkwardly at the person at the counter she was a Embarrassed and defeated, she grabs the arm of the youngest, fully anticipating at this point the nuclear meltdown that's a. She turns to the kids and she says, Kids, we gotta go. Mama forgot her money at home. Hoping through that white lie to salvage just, salvage just a little bit of dignity. Stunned, the kids look up, tears form in their eyes. But they could tell by the intensity of her look, this wasn't a moment to test Mama. This parade of dejected, hungry, disappointed, would-be golden archers marches to the minivan. She buckles them in, sits down in the front seat, and starts to cry. She revs the engine, only to see check engine light come on. In another home in the same city, staring at a pile of bills, knowing that the math should work out. I mean, they both have good jobs. They both make decent money, but there just never seems to be enough. They always seem to be on the short side, left floating checks at the end of the week, hoping that they don't clear before the direct deposits come in. And as he sits there trying to figure out how to rob Peter to pay Paul, He can see the glistening glow of Amazon on her glasses as she scrolls through her phone, loading up her cart full of good deals that no one would want to miss. Secretly, he resents her, seeing her as the reason for this disparity. Unable to recognize how his fishing addiction, sorry, hobby, has contributed to this dilemma. And that night, they will have an explosive argument over a seemingly random issue, and they'll both think it was over that seemingly random issue. But what they both fail to realize is that their lack of financial peace continues to undermine any possibility of tranquility in their home. In still another household in that same city, the urgency of the moment demanded that he ignore the long-term risks, walking away yet again from the check-in-to-cash place located in the strip mall where he gets his hair cut. He knew this this would be enough to get him through. Unfortunately, typically, what is enough to get us through never seems to get us ahead. Leaving him already a week behind, and if something came up, he might not be able to pay the $45 fee at the end of the week, leaving him susceptible to the 400% APR that is attached to that loan. And each of these scenarios play out in our homes each and every week, contributing to high levels of anxiety and stress and depression, and yes, even divorce. And though we live in the single most affluent culture in the world, our lack of a biblical vision of handling and managing our money makes us feel like we are constantly on the back end of the deficit. Like there's just never enough. Which makes me want to ask the question of this series. 
What would happen if we would begin to treat what we have in the way in which it was intended to be treated? Which is to say, what would happen if we treated what we have as gift from God? What if we begin to believe as followers of Jesus that there is no such thing as a self-made man or woman, but that instead everything that we have and all that we have has been given to us as gift? And that we're somehow responsible then to figure out how to utilize that gift in a God-honoring manner. See, the problem for many of us is that we're pragmatists at heart. So what happens is we come across the difficult situation and we immediately jump to what are the five tools, the six steps, the seven principles, or what works. What works in this moment, in this crisis to get me out of it? And that what works is detached from any overarching story through which to make sense of our actions and behaviors. And so what happens is we do what I call living above the line, where we only live in behavior modification. Any, any problem that we face, any difficulty that comes our ways, we immediately join, jump to what is the behavior that I need to change in order to fix the situation that I find myself. The problem is that behavior modification is, is above the line, the line being the place of true transformation. You, you don't change long term by simply changing behavior. So I want to suggest if we're going to take this journey seriously and ask the question, what does it look like for us to have a biblical vision for the ways in which we are called to steward and manage what God has given to us as gift, I think we've got to avoid this tendency to jump into tools and principles and actions and behaviors and go below the line where character and values are found. Because I am convinced of this, that the only way that we see true substantive change over the long term is not by changing behavior, but actually undergoing a change of heart. Where the very character, the very very value system, the very posture, my very attitude towards all that God has given me changes. And when that changes, something begins to happen in our lives. So we're going to take this journey over the next four weeks. And it's a journey that's going to push us to come to terms with what is a biblical vision of personal financial management? What, what does it look like for me to honor God with what I've been given. And, and I want, I know we want, like, give me some tools. And you might get some tools along the way. But what I'm asking you, what I'm challenging you to do is to understand what is my character? What are my values when it comes to who God has created me to be and what he's called me to utilize what he's given me? And so we're going to introduce a, a, an acronym to you for this series. It's an acronym that we're going to become very familiar with here at Bridgeway because anytime we talk about about utilizing what God has given us. We're going to utilize this acronym and its gift because I do believe with everything that is within me that everything that we've been given is a gift. John Wesley, one of our, our forefathers of our tradition, once said, and I love this statement, it's not so much how much of my money am I going to give God, but how much of God's money am I going to keep for myself? That's a posture thing. That's a character thing. And so what kind of character is it that produces that kind of vision for how we handle it. and so we're going to look at each of these letters the g being what does it look like to live in generosity versus greed that's a character thing what is the character of investment instead of indebtedness what's the character of being faithful versus being frivolous and what is the character that produces the ability to see ta tithing versus tax <laughs> and how we handle what god has offered to us so this, for some of us, is going to be like a beginning. Because some of us may have to take this on and then, and then maybe do Financial Peace University that we offer next year. But I want to start in the right place. I want to start by recognizing the necessity of addressing our character, our posture, our attitude, who we are in Christ, and how that should affect what we have. So let's jump in here. Let's, let's go right to the G. Because I think the G is a big deal. I think the G is huge. This generosity versus greed now a lot of people a lot of us think we're really generous people i mean we let them take that dollar from us at walmart to help saint jude once in a while we give the five dollars to help the backpack program occasionally we may even give ten dollars to the red cross when there's a time of tragedy and so we think that we're generous now that no, none of those are bad things please, please keep doing those things but it doesn't mean that we are generous Generosity is a value of a certain kind of character. 
See, many of us, we give when it's convenient or we give begrudgingly or worse yet, I think this is a reality. Some of us give so that when we give, everybody can see we give so that they can applaud us and pat us on the back for what we've given. There's all sorts of reasons why people give. It doesn't mean they're generous. For me, generosity is a character, and, and we're going to define this in a little bit here, but it's prudent, industrious, purposeful, prepared, and sacrificially selfless. Let me say that again. Generosity is a character that is prudent, industrious, purposeful, prepared, and sacrificially selfless. So we're going to talk about that. But greed is also a character issue. Greed is a, is a posture of ownership versus management. So in greed, we, we make the declarations, mine, 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 and I get to do with mine all that I want to do with mine. The managerial mindset says, God, it's yours. And you've given, so what can I do to be faithful with what you've given me? Because to them who have been given much, much will be required of them. And we in our culture have been given much. So it's moving away from, from ownership to management. Greed is, is, is a heart issue. It's a selfish, self-centered lifestyle. And I hate to say this. I hate to say this because I feel like, like I'm not throwing stones because I feel like this is right back to me. Is that greed ends up being at its heart idolatry. Because think about this. It's our attempt to find value, security, safety, and gratification from the possession of or acquisition of more. Think about that. It, wherever we find value, security, safety, and gratification, kind is our God. So therefore, greed becomes idolatry. Greed is hiding just about everywhere in our culture. It's the thing that suggests to us that the person who dies with the most toys wins. It's the person who chooses self over family, who puts a family's well-being into a bind because of their must-haves that are really nothing more than want-tos. Greed is the equivalent of the adult spoiled brat who internally, sometimes externally, stomps their foot every time that they don't get what they want. Greed turns married couples into enemy combatants, each of them selfishly vying for their desires, telling lies, covering up, secretly resenting each other because they have more than the other one does. And then there's a list that goes with greed too. Look at this list. Greed is consumptive, impulsive, controlling, manipulative, destabilizing, competitive, and suspicious. That's fun, huh? Greed is a contaminant that goes down into the core of our being and corrupts our, our view or understanding of everything we have and everything we're given. And greed can come from a number of different places. Greed can actually be the result of childhood insecurity. Meaning this, maybe you grew up in a family that mismanaged finances and you were always in a deficit. You never had enough. And you made the decision at that point when you were a child, that's never going to be me. So you have spent your life trying to acquire and possess and glean and gain and hoard so that you would never be in the place that you were when you were growing up. Some of us find greed because we have this sort of image-centered family reality where our value was measured by which neighborhood we lived in and how big our house was in that neighborhood, the kind of car we drove, the brand names that we wore, or the destinations of the vacations that we took. So, some of us found value in that growing up and we just sort of adopted that and carried that into our lives. And for some, greed is just a refusal of God. It's when we say, God, you can have all of me. Just leave my stuff alone. Because I, got, I earned my stuff. That's my stuff. God, I love you spiritually, but materially, I'm still about me. And I don't know that you can do spiritual without material. Greed undermines the stability of our homes, creates resentment in marriages, produces entitled or fearful children, and places self in the center of the universe where we were never intended to be. 
I remember when my kids were little. Kids can be greedy. You ever notice that? You ever watched one have a meltdown in Walmart? I remember when I was, my kids were little, they'd have a meltdown in Walmart. And I would, in a very lovingly and tender way, if you know me, it's lovingly and tender, get down and remind them, this is not your universe and I am not a visitor to it. Why is it adults we forget that and allow greed to deceive us and make us the center of our universes? When we really start to believe that everyone else exists to serve my needs. Well, that was fun, huh? <laughs> Somebody, some of you are new to here like, this better get better because this is not good. So let's do the biblical contrast, okay? Because I think there is a biblical contrast. I think greed is one side. I think we can flip it over. And I, can, I believe that we can discover what I call the character of generosity. And I think there's this very compelling example of it. Now, when I talk about generosity, I want to remind you that I'm speaking about it in a certain way. Because for me, it is a character that is prudent, industrious, purposeful, prepared, and sacrificially selfless. Where do I get this? So because it's Mother's Day, and because I was asked to wear this way too tight of shirt, I'm acknowledging what everyone else is thinking. All right? Some of you are wondering, does he know that doesn't fit? Yes, I do. Thanks. I thought I would go to Proverbs 31. Because Proverbs 31 is actually entitled, A Woman of Noble Character. Now I love that because it, it speaks to the character issue right from the get-go. It recognizes that whatever's about to be described is not about actions and behaviors, it's about character. And there's one particular line that when we start thinking about generosity, we want to jump to, which is verse 20. She opens her arms to the poor and she extends her hands to the needy. And that, yes, that is generosity at work. But you need to understand that that verse comes in the middle, nestled right in between of a whole bunch of stuff that comes before and a bunch of stuff comes after. And I believe it's what comes before and what comes after that sort of makes what's in the middle possible. And we're going to look at this person's story. Now, guys, there's a temptation in here that I'm going to read this and you're going to like, yep, that's the way my wife should be. Don't say that. She's sitting next to you. But I, I want to say this, there is so much packed into this that is just so right about all of us. And I think what makes this proverb so real is that the wise sage who wrote it recognized that sometimes, historically, women have done a better job of being selfless than us men have. Amen. And some, not everywhere, not always, but sometimes you, you have to go to this, this point to where it actually emerges from. So I think that's why we're going to look at this person's story. But I want you to see your whole story within this person's story and ask, how does my character, how do my values align with this? I love this. A good woman is hard to find and worth more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. Never spiteful, she treats him generously all of her life long. You know what I think generosity emerges from? Generosity emerges from a place on how we view ourselves and how we view ourselves in relationship to others. See, the, for the person who is generous, they don't view others as threats or enemies or competitors or combatants. They're not vying selfishly for stuff to make sure that they have enough, knowing that if they have enough, someone else is going to have to give something up. In fact, the generous person changes their posture towards others completely and recognizes that my life is best lived as I give it away. As my posture towards those who are near, my family, those who are close, my associates, and those who are needy, what is my posture towards them? Are they an inconvenience to me because really this is about me and they exist to serve me? Or am I called to just live in service to them? I think a lot of generosity has to do with answering that question. How do I understand myself and how do I understand myself in relationship to others? Do I expect in my home to stand in the center and everything else swirls about me, orbits around me? I want to tell you, you want to you you blow up your household? Stand in the center of your universe. Make your universe about you. That's, how you. that's how you deteriorate a family household. You, you want to see a household thrive? Everybody give themselves away to each and everyone else. 
So what's your posture towards yourself? And I love it because he says, she, she's never spiteful. She doesn't do it resentingly. So you're like, I serve my family all the time, right? <laughs> that would be missing the heart of what was just said. Uh, but I will say this, as you begin to care for each other and you do that well, you'll find that none of your needs are ever missed because you're constantly serving each other to make up those needs. But that's not it. It goes on to say this. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoys knitting and sewing. She's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. I think that generosity is the result of prudence. You know what prudence is, right? Prudence is the careful attentiveness to detail. And the opposite of this would be reckless and hasty. Our lives are typically reckless and hasty when it comes to our finances, which, which leads us to this place. We see what we want for $300, and it tells us if we use our credit card, we can get 10% off, which makes it 270. That's a great deal. Cha-ching. What we forgot was we didn't have the money to buy it for 270 in the first place, which when we realize that is typically too late, which means we've ended up spending $380 with the additional finances charges over an eight month period, which we didn't have money to spend in the first place for the thing that we thought we were gonna get for 270, we've now spent $110 more than we thought we were gonna spend. There's no prudence in that. Some of you are like, I just did that yesterday <laughs> for my Mother's Day gift <laughs> to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, I got to go to the store. Take something back. No, that's, that's, that's reckless and hasty. Because what I believe about prudence is prudence is a strategic use of resources that makes generosity a possibility. When we're prudent and not reckless and hasty, because think about it, if, if a need arises and I've already given that $80 away to some bank somewhere, I can't meet that need and offer generosity because I'm already obligated to something or someone else because of my reckless haste. But that's not it, I love this. She's up before dawn preparing breakfast. Amen. No, sorry. <laughs> Me thinking out loud. Uh, for her family and organizing her day, she looks over a field and buys it. Then with money she's put aside, she plants a garden. First thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeve, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work, is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and hearth, diligent in homemaking. I love this. You know what generosity is? Generosity springs from a character that is industrious and not idle. In our culture, many of us fall prey to this, I want everything now, but I don't really want to do anything to get it. But being industrious means that we were created for action, meaningful action. And what I've come to realize and believe is that those who give themselves to meaningful action typically are less inclined to worry about the whims and the fancies and the fickle desires of selfish greed. They just don't have time for it, right? It's not even like, they're not even worried about it because they've given themselves away to, to, to things that, you know, what, you know what the problem with idleness is? It's the, idleness is the breeding ground for greed. Because when you're idle, you just got too much time to want, right? So in our lack of action, our lack of activity, our lack of meaningful work, we just think about all the stuff we don't have that we wish we had. We spend too much time scrolling through Facebook, seeing what everybody else has that you don't, and you just live a life of want. And what I'm convinced of is that the generous person has moved past that because they're giving themselves to industrious activity, meaningful affairs, where that stuff just doesn't matter as much. She's quick to assist anyone in need, reach out to the poor, we've talked about that. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. Their winter clothes are all mended and ready to wear. 
She makes her own clothing and dresses in colorful linens and silks. I love this. Someone who has the character of generosity lives a prepared life. They, they refuse to live a life on the scramble. There's a thoughtfulness and planning to life. But most of us are so busy serving the fickleness of our urgent desire and want now that we don't attend to the planning of what we will actually need in the future. So that when we get to the future, we go, what do I do now? What we didn't realize is that we had sabotaged that need with that want that we gave ourselves to away in haste and hadn't prepared, hadn't fought it out. Hey, guess, I love this. I think what she would say to us is, guess what? Winter's coming around every year. It's going to get cold. Probably going to need some stuff. Your electricity bill is going to go up every year at the same time. You could probably plan for that. That's, that's the life, right? That's the prepared life. That's the life that recognizes, because, because here's the truth. Life in the scramble and on the backside of fickle makes impossible our ability to help out when needs arise around us. People say, hey, can you help me out? Or an opportunity arises and you say, I don't have it. No, actually you did, but we opted to use it in a different way. But it doesn't end there. I love this one. This one's good. She designs gowns and sells them, brings the sweaters she knits to the dress shops. Her clothes are well-made and elegant. She's always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say. She always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. I think a generous person is purposeful. Life is best lived with a certain degree of stability and purpose. Generosity springs from a character where we have an intentional, strategic, measured, purposeful approach to life. A lack of intentionality creates waste. And waste eliminates opportunity. Think about that one for a moment. If you were in this last 12 months, add up every bit of waste that had been the result of a lack of purpose, how much money would you now have if you hadn't done that? These are the things that we don't ask ourselves, well, we don't want to ask ourselves. So, so what happens is, because we, are, we lack intentionality or we lack purposefulness, we end up paying that, that late charge on that credit card or on that something that we're doing and it's like throwing money away and when we throw that money away it's never coming back to you but that was the very thing that God might have been saying this is your opportunity to be generous I love what John Wesley says again and what I loved about John Wesley's preaching is that he always addressed issues like this and he would say this I love I think this is so good earn as much as you can be industrious Save as much as you can, be prepared, and then give as much as you can, be generous. And he would say all of those three go together. You earn, you save, so that you can give. That when there's an opportunity, an option, something arises, you can say, yes, I can do that because I've, I've been intentional in stewarding what God has given me well. And then I love the result of this. This is so good. This is the result of this kind of life. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you've outclassed them all. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades. The woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. Give her everything she deserves. Festoon her life with praises. I love that. That to me speaks to the nature of when we give our lives away without seeking admiration, that there's always an admiration that comes because people see in our lives something different than what they're accustomed to seeing. We're able to respond faithfully in ways that maybe we never could before. There is something beautiful, I think, in that process, right? 
And, and what I love about generosity is generosity points away from me to the giver of the gift, whereas greed points everything to me. What I have to ask the question is, is that how I want to be known? Do I want to be known as the person who tries to stand in the center of my self-created universe and refusing everyone to orbit around it, serving my desires, selfishly vying for everything that I want? Or am I going to live with outstretched arms, giving myself away, just giving myself away? But in order to do that, you've got to, you see, generosity is not just about frivolous giving of stuff. It's about living a prudent, intentional, purposeful, strategic, industrious kind of life. Because when you do that, your affairs are in order and the opportunities that arise can be met without even concern. Because you can just live given because you've done all the work getting there. That's a character thing. We can give you principles and tools, but until the character changes, we're still going to be hasty and reckless. Until the character changes, we still may have a tendency towards idleness. But once that character changes, something happens in our lives. Something is transformed in our lives. And we begin to live out of that in, in brand new expressions. Now, for those of us in here, this is a journey for us. Some of us are going to ask God, I need you to realign my life. There was a time when I started off the right down the right path, but I got, I veered off and I need you to realign me and I need you to transform my posture, my mindset, my attitude, my character, my values so that I can be more God honoring with the things that you have gifted me with. For some of us, we've never began this journey. So you're going to be like, okay, I'm gonna do this Jesus thing, but I think he's about to mess up my life. I can assure you, if you're about to do this Jesus thing, he's about to mess up your life. But I will tell you, you, would, you will not have it any other way. Because actually when he messes up your life, he makes your life whole. He brings the pieces back together and makes you different. And you go, ah, that was, oh, it was painful, but good. So some of us are going to begin that journey. But I'm trusting that as we take this journey, we're all going to come out different somehow, some way. So I'm going to ask my worship team to come out. I just want to give some space for the Lord to do his work right now. Because some of us have just swallowed a whole bunch of stuff that we did not want to swallow when we walked into this room. Some of us were like, oh, if I knew this was going to be the topic, I so would not have come today. So we just need to give the spirit a little bit of room to move. A little space to do his thing. And as we do that, I just want to invite you to just, to just take a moment and say, God, what, what about my heart? What about my character? What about my values? What about my posture? What about my attitude towards the gifts that you've given? Do I need to change? What kind of difference do you want to make in my life? And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to do one more thing here as we close. And I think you're really going to appreciate this last thing. So would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for these moments in which we wrestle with and deal with and struggle with what it means to be faithfully yours. Lord, I ask for your blessing in these moments where you speak to us. Have your way with us. Remind us of the, the change and the difference that you want to bring in our lives. In Jesus' name.